with so many podcasts out there, shows can get lost in the shuffle. That's why we implore you to check out Too Many Captains. You can find us at a moviepodcast.com. Five unique takes on Hollywood movies and culture. Find us on Twitter at It's a Film Podcast. Check our intellectual deep dives into theatrical films. Find us on Instagram at Too Many Captains Productions. Unique takes on soundtracks. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash too many captains productions. Find us at a moviepodcast.com on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play. And now, here comes a new episode of Collateral Cinema. I'm Bo Maddox. I'm Robert Ortegon. I'm Ashley Chancellor. This is Collateral Cinema. <laughs> Welcome to Collateral Cinema, the only movie podcast that matters, where we focus on good movies, bad movies, and everything else in between in the world of cinema. We're podcasting straight from somewhere in South Texas, and yes, my friends, we are a 420-friendly podcast. So whatever you have, be it dabs, blunts, bongs, or joints, smoke it if you've got it. And happy Halloween, everybody. Happy Halloween. Yo, happy Halloween. Halloween. Yeah. Where's Dakota at? Yeah, good question. And, and I, what, I, what is he going to be for Halloween? He's going to be a twink. A twink. Oh, a twink. wow. <laughs> what the fuck? Jesus Christ, bro. Oh, my God. Ladies and gentlemen, don't listen to him at all. Don't listen to Ash. <laughs> I was going to say he could be the other Zach and Cody twin. I don't know. What do you think, Ash? Dylan or Cole Sprouse. <laughs> 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 Not the blue one, okay? <laughs> the other one. Oh, that's funny, dude. Oh, my God. Already, this is becoming a spooky episode, right? Yeah, Halloween special, Boy Meets World style. Boy Meets World style. Oh, yeah. Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon. Ken and, and Kel Halloween specials. Oh, there oh, we go. Remember those? <laughs> oh, Kenan and Kel. Oh, shit. That is awesome mm-hmm. right there. Something that you don't know anything about, right, Ash? Have you ever seen Are, Are You Afraid of the Dark, dude? It's the greatest shit ever. Have you seen Are You Afraid of the Dark? Oh, yeah. Yeah, with your mom. Oh. Wow. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Damn it. Are we really are we really resorting to mom jokes on here no, now? No, that's too old. We're not five anymore, right? Yeah. yeah. I think that we need to stay within the spirit of the holiday. Yeah. It's extra spooky well, you know what? and horrific. I'll take all that and- back. I'm sorry, Ash. That's not what your mom said last night. I don't care what she said. Oh my God. The, Just the don't tell numbers. me about it. Just don't tell me about it, Ash. I don't care. Anyway, happy Halloween once again, everybody. We are back with another horror movie on in what is indisputably the month of horror movies. I mean, I hope that everybody out there is just watching every horror movie that you can find. I don't care if it's like the most bargain basement, like dollar movie that you can find uh, at, at Dollar General or whatever. Yeah. Some people just resort back to the originals. I mean, that's what we do, right? Oh, all the time. I mean, I, mean, I have to put every halloween movie on in october just watch them all in order yeah all in order yeah. exactly including halloween oh of course yeah the halloween movies. we were we were gonna do halloween actually but then they ended up uh suspending it till next year we were doing halloween kills oh yeah halloween yeah, kills yeah, yeah. they're supposed to be out this year but they postponed it and we were totally gonna do an episode about it but yeah. you know it was gonna be this episode oh yeah, yeah. It was going to be this episode right here, but, you know, COVID and all. COVID. Shit happens. Yep, shit happens, doesn't it, though? I mean, it really is a scary year, so this is going to be a scary month. I I, I think people should just dress up as as COVID. Oh, definitely. (laughs) Or or dress up as as Donald Trump. Oh, yeah, definitely. No, dress up like Karen. Have you you seen that Karen mask? (laughs) Oh, God, dude. (laughs) Oh, is Lord. there a Karen mask? That's There's awesome. totally a Karen mask, and it's frightening. But anyway, 
this movie that we are focusing on for our Halloween special is actually quite appropriate for this current time in our zeitgeist, kind of. It does yeah. kind of fit the climate, doesn't it? Very much so. And of course, we are talking about the all-time classic, the progenitor of the zombie genre, George Romero's Night of the Living Dead, straight from 68, right? 1960. 1960. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Oh, man. This movie is pretty much the beginning of modern horror, at least for me. Like, some would argue that maybe when you go back to, like, Psycho, that's kind of where it starts to kind of make that shift. But mm. I don't know. There's just something about this movie where there's just grittiness, there's gore. I mean, there's a heavy social commentary in this movie which we'll get into here in a little bit. But we have this movie playing in the background, and, man, this movie means a lot to so many people, and it means a lot to me as well. Yeah, I, I have to watch this every Halloween, you know? Yeah, it's pretty much required viewing. And it's also appropriate because it originally came out, I, I think, October 1st in, yeah. in, in, the, in the 60s. October 1st in theaters, and I saw one of the original release dates yeah and initial release date was like october 4th i'm not sure yeah, yeah. And, and that was about 52 years ago yeah this was recently it was the 52nd anniversary of night of the living dead long time ago yeah and this movie it's it somehow manages to be timeless but still a product of its time in so many ways yeah but you know it's interesting too because there's so many things about this film that feel ahead of its time. You know what I mean? There's 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 progressive elements to it. I mean, notwithstanding, of course, the fact that we've got you know a black actor portrayed as the as the protagonist, and there's not even a point that's made about that. I mean, George Romero didn't do that on purpose. George Romero picked a black actor because he just simply was the best fit. You know, it, it, that, that's all that it was. Is he was the best actor, you know, for, for that role. Yeah, and it's easy to see why, because this actor, what was his name? It was Dwayne Jones, right? Dwayne Jones, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this guy just takes control of this movie. I mean, he is, like, the main focus of the movie, as far as I'm concerned. And, I mean, he... Cast a commanding performance over everybody else in this movie. It's more of a stage actor feel, right? Yeah. In many ways, there's parts of this movie that does feel like a stage play. Yeah. Inside a boarded up house. Yeah. There's a lot of it that happens in a single environment. I mean, in just a single house. Like, there's different places within the house that they go, but usually it's really just the living room and the cellar that you see them and outside. Yeah. When they start setting stuff on fire right, to keep her, all the ghouls away right yeah and, and that that's the point that you need to make is like these are ghouls they're not zombies yet that hadn't that, of course that hadn't been invented yet that terminology hadn't happened yet the, so yeah the, the term hadn't been coined yet at least not in its current form i mean i believe it's a haitian term right originally yeah. It, I mean, zombies at first, when they were shown in popular culture, they weren't really like reanimated corpses that were lusting after brains or flesh, as it were. They were kind of presented in at least what could be seen as a stereotypical type of voodoo ritual, more or less. Yeah. And, and it was a ritual that actual voodoo priests did. I mean, of course, they used, uh, I, I believe they used a toxin uh, that is derived from the puffer fish to pretty much make people kind of go into this uh, coma, pretty much. And eventually the person that they targeted would eventually come out of that coma and that would have the illusion of, you know, coming back from the dead. Okay. I've seen that That's in the interesting. Movie, Buried Alive. Yeah, there, there's something similar to that in Buried Alive. And we'll get into some of the other zombie movies that we've seen here in a little while. Or some, some different Buried Alive. Not, not the one we're talking about. Y yeah, 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 yeah. But this movie, it, it follows seven people. They're trapped in a farmhouse. This is in western Pennsylvania, right? Yeah, exactly. And this farmhouse, it's just the center stage for a struggle of the ages in many ways. The middle of nowhere, really. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not just a struggle between the zombies and the humans. It's a struggle between the humans themselves. 
I mean, conflict is constantly present in this movie. Yeah, and I like the throughout most of the movie, there's not even a lot of zombie action. It's just a lot of the tenseness of the situation mm. and, and the conflict that's happening between the humans, which is prevalent in a lot of, uh, I think, zombie media today. Like you have like The Walking Dead yeah. or The Last of Us, which are also stories that feature zombies, but tend to focus on on the human aspect of, you know, how would humans react in this scenario? So it, it really all draws back to this film, the original zombie film. I mean, hell, even the fact that they never use the word zombie, that's a trope that's repeated in most zombie movies, you know, is, is that zombies don't exist in fiction and in, in their world. Yeah. I mean, all of that is just hard baked into the genre starting here. This is the er example of all of those tropes. Yeah, exactly. And it all comes from here. I mean, they haven't they didn't start eating brains yet. I think that came in one of the shameless ripoffs. Um, or one of the sequels to this, or that started becoming a thing. Maybe but Shaun the idea the of, of yeah, Shaun yeah, the dead. Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of like cannibalist. That's a great movie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the idea of cannibalistic undead corpses, you know, is, is it, slow moving. You know, really owes itself back to the original George Romero film, and I think. You know, over time, we've become desensitized to that idea. But at the time, this must have been terrifying. And I know this movie was controversial, too, for its its use of gore and, and violence. Yeah, so much of this just had not been seen before in movies. I mean, you can argue that early, early on in the history of cinema, there was some allusions to graphic violence. But this right here is when it actually was just laid bare and was just extremely visceral. You actually see the flesh and the sinew and the guts and everything. Yeah. So did you know that the actors were eating ham that was covered in chocolate? Oh, and so they wow. were actually like getting like pale and because it was so disgusting that they didn't need to put makeup on them anymore. Yeah, that is fucking horrid. I, 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 I think that somewhere. I think that they got most of the parts for this from a local butcher. And uh, there's a story, I don't know if it's apocryphal or if it's been confirmed, that eventually some of the guts spoiled and they had nice. to use it anyway. Oh, so shit. Hell yeah. Yeah, they were using rotting meat in a lot of these scenes. And that, like, oh, that makes me just bleh. Real effect. That's some know, Kubrickian right shit right there, right? Oh, God, <laughs> it's like man. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Like, real. No, even Texas Chainsaw Massacre wasn't that gross. No, but. You know? A real live version. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, yeah, it's gross. I mean, they, they it's fully out there. And it kind of seems, I, I would say this, this movie might seem tamed by today's standards in a lot of ways. It's really not. It's not that bad, but at the time, I mean, this yeah. was huge. We'd never seen this in cinema, especially not in something so mainstream, I, I would say. Or I don't know if, the, if this was mainstream at the time or if maybe it was more of a cult thing. It's certainly mainstream now. I'm pretty sure that it was kind of a flop, right, Robert? It didn't. What, what did it gross? It, it was a $114,000 budget. Yeah, it grossed like 250 times its budget, really. Yeah, but initially when it was released, the actual budget was like 114,000 and uh the gross was like 12 million domestically US. Wow, really? It was that kind of successful? Yeah, and 18 million internationally earning 250 times its worth, you know. God damn. Well, yeah, so I guess it, it really did make its money. I mean, obviously it spawned a lot of sequels and ripoffs and remakes, but from what I'm aware of, I mean, it, 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 it was at its time still regarded as more of a cult classic because it was, it was heavily criticized. And now it's become something so much more than what it originally was. I mean, especially now that, you know, film scholars have pretty much dissected this movie to no end, especially with the social commentary that is present in the film. But I mean, Romero says that he didn't really do that intentionally and that, I mean, he just wanted to make a silly, dumb B movie pretty much. That's what he was setting out to do. But I mean, this movie is so impactful, especially when you consider the politics of the time. I mean, this came out with the backdrop of the civil rights movement of the war in Vietnam that was going on around that time, or I think it was about to really explode as it did. And 
I really see a lot of interesting parallels with what's going on today, especially with Black Lives Matter and, and the like. And what I kind of see going on here, the dynamic here is it's not just, you know, black versus white or anything like that and taking that look at it in, in a racial lens. To me, it's the struggle between radical black activists that were involved in the civil rights movement at that time that were they, they were really the ones that really pushed that movement versus the more milk toast white liberal mindset. That's what I see here. That's that's what's represented with Cooper and his family. It's like they're they're looking for false comfort. Okay. Yeah, you know, and, and even if a lot of these aspects weren't by design on, on, on you know, Romero's part, I think you see in it kind of what you want to. Uh, and there's kind of this unexpected quality of allegory, I guess. Yeah. I mean, going back to what I was saying, like, I mean, if you look at Ben, Dwayne Jones' character, I mean, he's pretty much the one trying to take a direct kind of action against this threat which, I mean, the zombies, like, as far as I'm concerned, they symbolize unrest. They symbolize chaos. That's what they are. They're an agent of chaos. And, and that's really what it was at that time. There was a lot of chaos surrounding these movements. Yeah, I can definitely see that. That's interesting. And, I mean, even Martin Luther King Jr. said something about, you know, moderate liberals, especially moderate white liberals, being a lot more dangerous to the movement than actual fascist, racist type people at the time. Wow. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting too because, you know, like you said, if the zombies represent chaos, then, ghouls. you know, the character Ben yeah, ghouls, represents yeah, ghouls, as it were. The ghouls, yeah. Ghouls. The, the character Ben represents order and he definitely takes that. I mean, I like how he just sort of takes control. He hops into someone else's house and tells that family what the fuck to do. He's it's like, not, you can go down in the cellar. If you're up here, I'm in charge. <laughs> See, it's it's not so much order that he represents. It's organization that he represents. He's trying okay. to organize a response to this chaos that is happening, this threat, this violence coming from the white supremacist state. I think I noticed that when yeah. he picked up the gun. I was like, yeah. Yeah. Taking control of it. He's taking control right away. Exactly. And that's because he's trying to actually organize a direct response to it. Exactly. Meanwhile, Cooper and his family, they're ensconced in their privilege. In the cellar. I, like, I mean, that's what the cellar is. The cellar is the comfort of their own privilege. You know, and it's their inability to really see the threat for what it is. Okay. Wow. I mean, if you really look at it from that angle, I mean, it becomes even more pertinent for our time, especially with Black Lives Matter. And I saw that when they were deciding who goes in the cellar and who doesn't, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's or stupid. Whether, to, no. whether or not to even go in the cellar to begin with. That's stupid, though. Yeah. You're, you're basically barricading yourself, though. I mean, it's, there's no exit, you know? I think from a tactical standpoint, I mean, it would have made sense to kind of do a little bit of both, like barricade the windows in the main house, put up a fight if you need to, but as a last resort, go into the fucking cellar. I would just get on the roof with the sniper, right, Bo? Yeah. With the Although there's a lot of people that also point out that maybe going to the cellar probably would have been a good idea. It would. How thick is that door? I mean, it was barricaded. Yeah. I mean, in the end, that's what they end up doing. And yeah. that's how Ben ends up surviving. Technically is, you know, once he's forced down the cellar, he barricades it out and then he's good. I mean, he he survives the night only to get shot right at the end there yeah. mistaken for a zombie. I mean, if that's not just the, the craziest ending and if we're if we're continuing along the allegory that you're describing, that is so pertinent. Because it's like even after all the sacrifice, even after all of the work that's been done and and all the perseverance, I mean, in the end, it, it just normally gets shut down and, by and someone how, who doesn't understand. And how does he meet his end? He meets in his end at the hands of a representative of the white authoritarian state. Yeah. It's like he, he's essentially lynched in a way. There, there's even yeah. that iconography that's kind of invoked yeah. in, in the ending. They take his body in the, the photography ending. 
and they throw them along with the, the ghouls and they burn them, right? Yeah. And, and that's with a lot of uh, like happy looking, portly white people just kind of standing around, taking pictures, like yeah. being like, yeah. <laughs> it, was like, it was like a lynching. It was a, a Trump it, Straight rally. up. It was yeah. A- there, there, there are historic pic- pictures that have that same imagery and it's fucking horrific you know he's the he's the final boy right <laughs> he's kind of the final boy yeah in a way i mean insofar as you know zombie movies have final girls and final boys i mean yeah it's usually a couple or it's just like one final girl you know yeah well it's him and barbara and then barbara gets fucked <laughs> you realize that yeah. barbara is gone she is taken by the horde and you're like okay i guess it's just been now yeah well i mean fitting back into the allegory i was talking about i mean barbara is an interesting character because to me she's the normal apolitical you know non-radical person you know and she's completely traumatized yeah, by gonna, the, by the chaos she, she's yeah, yeah. like like she's the the mainstream population, the mainstream idea or she's, ideal. And that's good because she's not part of the problem, but she's a burden, you know? Yeah. And, she's, and, she's in the way. It's like she's in she's shock. She's in the way. The exactly. Yeah. yeah. Seeing her brother being taken down, turned into a, a zombie, a ghoul, sir. Yeah. That's a crazy scene in its own right is. I'm just worried about that Pontiac, it, bro. Damn. Yeah. Like smash the door in the fender, right? Ash, the door but in the fender. Fuck. That that's like the source of Barbara's trauma and it's understandable because just imagine, you know, you're going to a cemetery to pay respects to it was their father, right? Yeah. They're paying respects to their father. And, you know, first, I mean, one second he's just ribbing her and joking with her and everything, and then the next second, he's having to fight for his fucking life and for his yeah. sister's life. And then he's mm-hmm. killed right in front of her. After his Ryan Gosling driver gloves comes along? No, he doesn't take Did them anyone? off. He has one he has on. He them on the whole time. Did y'all notice how her recounting of the story was completely different to what actually happened in the film? Well, yeah, they, by that make, point, she's unreliable because she's traumatized. Yeah. I mean, she's, she's I mean you, can, you can apply that as a you know retroactive in-universe explanation, but I legitimately think that there must have been a script rewrite at some point, <laughs> and then they, it, was, it wasn't changed. But, you know, in-universe, it makes sense. I mean, she's traumatized. She doesn't remember what the fuck happened. Did you see how she reacted to her brother when she saw him as a zombie? Oh, that she, was tragic. She just went with him right out the door and then... You assume she turns into a zombie, of course, right? Or a ghoul. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, she's definitely at least ripped uh, apart by the ghouls. Yeah. You know? Her brother comes back, and that's her last chance of seeing her brother again, right? Yeah. But also, it, it furthers her trauma as well, because not only did she watch him die once, I mean, now she's having to see him reanimated. She's having to see him as a ghoul. Yeah. Well, it gets me, you know, there's that one part that gets me where Helen is being killed by the reanimated daughter, you know, and as a parent, I mean, that really strikes me because how horrible is it to, you know, not only know that your child's gone, I mean, they're dead, but they're attacking you. I mean, you don't want to be in the position to have to murder your child, even though they're a zombie. I mean, we make those kind of rationalizations and we think, oh, yeah, that's not my kid anymore. But think about how traumatic that would be. You know, as a parent, I, you know, I can imagine as a parent. <laughs> yeah. They, oh, yeah. I mean, she she died in absolute terror crazy. because of she that. She just kind of let herself go. I mean, being and you don't blame her. She's completely traumatized. And yeah, you're, like, you're right. She just let herself go. I mean, what was she going to do? You know, I, what could she do? Honestly, I, I think that there's definitely some what's the word? It, it's alluded to that. I, I think that there's probably some domestic violence going around if not that then at least you know the father is is the figure of the house and he kind of you know controls everything that's going on so you know add add that onto her plate did y'all get those vibes with harry cooper i mean oh definitely Henry cooper? yeah he's definitely extremely patriarchal in his relationship definitely definitely a fox yeah. news kind of guy oh yeah total fox news guy yeah <laughs> Yeah, maybe not an actual domestic abuser, but there's definitely that sense of like, I'm the figure of the, I mean, we all know, you know, father figures that are like that. You know, what's interesting is to see, you know, just him getting put in his place by Ben. <laughs> oh, constantly. Yeah. I mean, their conflict is really what drives a lot of the movie. And and, and that that's, of course, the central theme here is conflict. And this movie, it actually became a series of movies. The second movie is also seen as a historically and culturally relevant film. It's also got its own level of social commentary going on with it. That's uh, Dawn of the Dead, of course. Dawn of the Dead, yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, we might go ahead and save a more in-depth analysis of that movie for an actual episode. But, yeah, in that movie, the actual themes are actually a little more blatant, even though Romero was still kind of coy about it and still claiming that, no, 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 we just wanted to make a fun, dumb, gory zombie movie. But, I mean, what that movie has to say about consumerism and about the emptiness of capitalist materialism is just spot on, you know? You know what? I think that that was the message of Poultry Guy's Night of the Chicken Dead, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, oh that, yeah, that movie is an all-time classic. What did you think? <laughs> that movie's great. Yeah. That movie is amazing. Fucking By the way, amazing. go check out our Patreon exclusive commentary on that one that's out. Yeah, that'll, that'll be out very soon. I'll have that out sometime this month. And then, yeah, definitely check out our Patreon. And check out probably, Poultry probably. Guys, Night of the Chicken Dead. Yeah, definitely check that movie out. You should have that out by Halloween, you know, just kind of a... Yeah, I, I sh I'll, I'll try to have it out by Halloween. But yeah, Dawn of the Dead is an all-time classic. It's required viewing in many ways. Many people even see it as superior to the original. What do you think, Robert? Uh, you know, Superior to the original? Yeah, you're right, definitely. Because in many ways, the original holds up to this day. Even, you know, watching the remake from like, what, 89 with the... Uh, the Candyman. Uh, oh, with Tony Todd. Tony Todd and, yeah. and it was directed I mean, by Tom Savini. Yeah, the Tom Savini one, dude. I like that one, but, you know, there's nothing like the original, you know? You can always go back to that one. Yeah. I mean, the, the original can really work as its own standalone movie. That's what's really great about Even it. Even though, remember, the Tom Savini one was a different ending. Yeah, and it also yeah. had a different characterization for Barbara as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, doesn't she end up being the survivor at the end? Yeah. Yeah, she's the survivor at the end, and I think Ben ends up being a zombie. He becomes zombified. Yeah. So they kind of made it a little more justified in shooting him, kind of. Justifiable okay. homicide. I don't yeah. know. I like the way that this one ends because it's so poignant. It's just, you know, and, and it's so quick, and it's done just very, what's the word? Not very, casual. It, very nihilistically, I would and, say. And it ends yeah. with, the, with the credits list. Yeah, just yeah. Not nonchalantly, you know, it's just yeah. done. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's like, I mean, it just shows how cheap life has, has become because of this monumental event. I mean, you know, isn't that, a little it, bit, um, isn't that a little bit relevant to our, our particular situation? I was about to say that, actually. Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting movie to be talking about when it comes to the pandemic. The COVID yeah. situation. Yeah, I mean... How do you think most of today's people would actually respond to a zombie apocalypse like this? Oh. Well, if they respond the same way they respond to wearing fucking masks. And toilet paper. Yeah, we'd be doomed. Yeah. We'd be so Those fucked. are the people that would leave other people behind for the zombies, 100%. But I you, already you, know who you are. Here's the other flip side of that. Those are also the same people that would go out into a huge hunting posse and go out just to shoot zombies and whatnot. And yeah. die. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They, they, they're they exactly the type of people that would do that. Fucking white people. Oh, my God. I know. <laughs> Damn it. The South will rise again. Oh, God. But, yeah, the, the movie after Dawn of the Dead is also very interesting. And I, I think maybe in that one, maybe Romero was a little more upfront about the meaning behind it. And that's Day of the Dead. Day of the Dead is really, really classic in that it has some excellent gore effects it has an incredibly tense scenario where you pretty much have, like, the last remnants of the military and of the scientific uh, community trying to figure this shit out. And they it's just not fucking working at all for them. And it, You know, speaking of the scientific community, I like how this movie ultimately is space zombies. Yeah, I, it I, pretty much is. Yeah, it's space zombies. The, the root cause, you know, or the, the theorized... Was a meteor um, yeah. uh, cause of all of this was was radiation, radiation from Venus, from right? Meteor. It was either from a meteor or from a satellite that crashed into Earth. Sputnik. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. That, that may have been a little bit of a reference to Sputnik, probably, yeah. or to some other Russian satellite or the blob. Yeah, it was only a, it was a space laser. probe on its way back from Venus. See, I knew Venus was part of it. Oh, okay, Sputnik. there you go. Sputnik. Yeah, there you go. And yeah, I mean, that, that just kind of speaks to the B-movie sci-fi horror film that Romero was trying to make here. You know, in the time period. 
Yeah, yeah. At its core, that's exactly what this is. I mean, think about it. This was right, but right when we were actually starting to explore. I mean, think about it, this was a year before we sent man to the moon, right? So, yeah. I mean, humans were were you know sending probes out, and we were having some missions and stuff. So, you know, that was a very it was a big unknown at the time. It was a you know, it, it's very analogous to the way that we view technology and social media today in popular culture, you know, as this thing that could be dangerous, could have some consequences. So, you know, it's kind of a catch all for, you know, unknown, you know, doom, doomsday events, you know, is it's probably going to be from outer spaces. We're going to probe too far, you know. Welcome to a night of total terror. <laughs> Night of the living dead, the dead who live on living flesh, the dead whose haunted souls hunt the living, the living whose bodies are the only food for these ungodly creatures. <laughs> of the living dead. A bizarre adventure in fear. An experience in shock more shattering than your strangest nightmare. Night of the living dead. A night with the dead who cannot die. A night of total terror. Night. Of the living dead. Yeah, yeah, probably. I can totally see that. I mean, that that was a constant theme throughout a lot of sci-fi and horror from this particular era, you know? Like like even if you look at something like the thing from another world. Yeah, I was going to mention that. Yeah, that kind of has the same vibe to it a little bit. I I would say I, I it, did did that movie come out before this? Like way before this, right? I think from another world. It was that the 50s? Yeah, I think like I don't know. 40, it was 47? the forties and fifties. Forty-seven. Do you think 49? that that movie could have had an influence on this? Yeah, in many ways. Yeah, in many ways. To, yeah, it had to have. Because I mean, that involved a virulent space influenced, you know, agent that would completely overtake humankind. And we f we forget the the last man on Earth story. Yeah. Yeah. If it's in price. And, and, yeah. and this was influenced by, I don't know if I, if I said this on the podcast or before we started recording, but I, I mentioned to you guys earlier that this was influenced by I Am Legend, the original novel. That, that's arguably the original zombie story. Except it's actually a vampire story. Yeah, yeah that's right. They're vampires. Is it? Yeah. yeah. The Will Smith version actually changed it to what was, you know, kind of more conventional zombies. But even then in that movie, they're a little bit different, I think. They're very um, different. Less, yeah. less more but, animated. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, th this movie is that was actually somewhat inspired by I Am Legend, the novel, interestingly enough. Which is a film that came out in 2007. So check that out. Yeah, and it had a way better ending than it got. Way better ending. I like the. But, uh, you, sorry. I like the Shelby Mustang in the beginning. Remember that? <laughs> of course you're going to like Shelby. the car in the movie. Of course. Who wouldn't like the fucking car? Who wouldn't like the fucking car? Of course like you're going to like that. 500 horsepower Shelby. Supercharged, bro. So you said we had Day of the Dead, and then what else from Romero's dead films? Yeah. After that, the next Romero-led Living Dead movie wouldn't come out until, like, the late 2000s, right? With well, what, Land of the Dead? Or was it Diary of the Dead that came out? Diary of the I Dead. I think it was Land of, Land of the Dead, then Diary. Land, yeah, at least. it was Land of the Dead. Land yeah. of the Dead was like 2005 or six, right? 2006. Oh, okay, okay. Leguizamo and Dennis Hopper, right? Yeah, that's and that's pretty crazy that you had Leguizamo and Hopper in a movie. The Mario Bros, right? Yeah. I know. Yeah, what the fuck is that? They meet again. And it was in a George Romero movie. Nice. Yeah, go check out a Super Mario Brothers episode. Oh, yeah. You definitely want to plug that one. Definitely. Do it now. 
But yeah, I really haven't seen Land of the Dead or Diary of the Dead. R- Robert, what what do you what are your thoughts on those movies and how they stand in this whole series of uh, movies? Land of the Dead is not bad. It's, it's almost like Return of the Living Dead. You know that sh- whole shopping mall scenario in the eighties, oh, right? You know what yeah, I mean? yeah. That's that's Dawn of the Dead with yeah, the shopping that, that's mall. That one, but in Land of the Dead, they live in a shopping building. Oh, okay. And you know everybody else outside, they're like street urchins, right? And oh then, wow! And then Dennis Hopper owns the buildings, like the main guy. Right? They're all doing jobs for him. Yeah. So he's kind of like a warlord in yeah, a way. Exactly. Do do Romero's of the Dead movies all take place in the same continuity, or? Yeah, they should, right? Yeah, just less men on earth scenario. Yeah. yeah. D- didn't Land of the Dead have a whole thing with the zombies where there was one that was becoming like a leader? Yeah, he was getting smarter. And that's interesting because that plays into something that was in Day of the Dead, which was the concept of zombies actually kind of regaining a little bit of consciousness a little bit. Like there was Bub, the the main zombie of that movie. And he was pretty much, you know, he, he was a lot more chill out he wouldn't like attack you not not unless you did anything he, he even shot the main villain of the main antagonist of that movie with a gun because apparently he yeah. had like some type of military background and everything he even saluted the the, the colonel like whenever he shoots him and kills him i mean that kind of ties back into that and and the idea of a Singular zombie just kind of rising up becoming like a spartacus amongst the zombies i mean that's compelling i'd say so yeah. <laughs> how many, and how then there's what a uh, survival of the dead, right? Right after land and diary. Remember the goosebumps? What yep. was it? Well, uh, well, hold on. Wasn't diary of the dead, like uh, the found footage movie that Romero did. I've never seen that one. You never seen that one. No. Yeah. I heard that that's what he, that that's the angle he went with, with diary of the dead is that found it's footage. literally a found footage movie pretty much, which makes sense at the time. I mean, paranormal activity was becoming a huge thing. Which that that pretty that's pretty much the series that kind of drove the whole found, found footage. footage genre into the ground a little bit, you know. Yeah. After some promising movies, Blair that, Witch, yeah, Blair Witch, of course, or or like Cloverfield, Cloverfield, or yeah. you know, there's like three Cloverfields, right? It's crazy. Yeah, but only one of them is a found footage movie, and that's the first one. Yeah, but what what was the last movie? It was Survival of the Dead. I never yeah, even that's saw what that it one. Says here. Uh-uh. I mean, that may have been the last movie that Romero ever actually worked on because, unfortunately, he passed away about a year or two ago, right? It, it was a couple of yeah. years ago at least. Well, the, those three were done in 05, 07, and 09. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm pretty sure, yeah, that yeah. was pretty much the, the last of his output in that series. Yeah, this was the last film to be directed by Romero before his death in 2017. Damn, there you go. 2017. 2017. God damn. It feels like just yesterday that he passed, man. Damn. Shit feels like just yesterday that we lost Wes Craven. It's 2015, right? Shit, Toby Hooper is dead. Dead. Jonathan Demme. Fucking, who else? Who else? Fucking William Friedkin, right? Damn. Sucks that you said Wes Craven. When you go oh, back. there's so many fucking directors from the 80s that are dead now. It sucks. Fuck, man. Fuck. Fuck. <laughs> right. Yeah. But this movie... Like I said before, it's timeless while still being a product of its time, but it's amazing how well it holds up. I mean, especially since you have two different versions of this movie. You have the original black and white version, and then you have the more modern colorized version, which you can find on Netflix right now. Now, Ash, I don't think that you actually watched the colorized version, right? No, I watched the black and white because that's what happened to be on the, the service that I was watching this through. I was watching this on Plex. Yeah, it's good. It's good to see this movie first with the original gritty black and white. You have to see it on black and white first. Yeah, I think so. I think I kind of appreciated it that way. Yeah, I mean, I have it on the TV right now, too. And there's just a certain feel to this that I think that that tone represents. You know what I was thinking while I was watching this? Okay, I would love to see a video game adaptation of this movie done kind of in the style of Resident Evil 7, less actiony and more just kind of survival horror exploration with, you know, some action elements, I think could be really, really cool. And just a direct adaptation with some minor changes to make it more, yeah. you know, playable. And, and, and you keep it within the time frame of the late 60s as well. Like, right, exactly. And 
just like how Ghost of Tsushima has a Kurosawa mode, which has, you know, shows the, the film in black and white with that grainy texture. This game should also have a filter, which would allow you to play it with the original black and white, you know, kind of grainy feel. At least that's what I would do. I thought I thought, thought that would be badass. I saw a lot of opportunity for that. But yeah, this movie still holds up amazingly well to this day. And just the fact that it created this genre that to this day is still being drawn from in horror and in popular culture. I mean, there's so many zombie movies that are kind of unique in their own right. Like Shaun of the Dead. Like Shaun of the Dead, which is very much almost a deconstruction of the zombie movie in a comedic sense. Oh, I love Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> yeah. And what I love about that movie is that it remains humorous, but it still has all of... There, there's still a, a serious zombie movie there, you know? I mean, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost are just kind of this duo that very much like Seth Rogen and James Franco, like anything that you see them in together is going to be good. Oh, it is. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be fucking Alluding to something, amazing. by the way, just hint, hint, something we'll be doing later this season involving, that's all we're going to tell you now, involving Rogan and Franco. So just Oh, yeah. Stay tuned. <laughs> oh, yeah. Stay tuned for that. But yeah, I mean, also Return of the Living Dead, that's an all-time classic. I mean, th that's actually what established the whole zombies eating brains trope. That's what it was. Okay. Yeah. And then that was more of like an alternate continuity from dawn of the dead like an alternate sequel done by the other co-writer right but what happened in that movie is night of the living dead supposedly actually happened and the remnants of that zombie outbreak is being held in that storage facility mm. that warehouse right yeah. so it's an alternate sequel you know both movies serve as sequels to night of the living dead just in separate continuities now what's interesting about that is how that seeks into the italian zombie phase because zombie 2 written and directed by lucio Fulci, like that was pretty much supposed to be a direct sequel to night of the living dead it was supposed to be a direct an actual direct sequel and, and it came out around the same time that dawn of the dead came out okay well it, you know now night of the living dead is also in the public domain so since then, we've gotten a lot of spinoff sequels, remakes, yeah. reboots. <laughs> I mean, I, I want to talk about the Italian zombie movies in particular because they had a different flavor of zombie. Like Burial Ground. Burial Ground. And like uh, The Blind Dead to a degree. I think that's Spanish, though. But Italian zombies, they're a lot more corpsey, you know? They're a lot more, like, decomposed. Yeah, you can see maggots on You can everything. see maggots worms, and worms coming out of them. And they're usually coming straight out of the ground. Yeah. Like, they, they just slowly real. come out of the ground. Nice. And, I mean, it's still pretty much the same lore, you know? Zombie bites you, you can get infected, you turn into a zombie and yeah. all that. But in most of those movies, especially, like, in Zombie 2, the zombies are even slower than they are in Night of the Living Dead. They're way slower. Right, Robert? Yeah, I mean, get your fast zombies from a uh, Resident Evil, right? And right. What was that other zombie movie? It was a Goosebumps film, right? What was it? I don't really remember. A Welcome lot of to Dead House. Okay, oh. yeah, there you go. Remember that dude? Yeah, it, yeah, it was yeah. Like this, there was. It was kind of like the take from George Romero, right? Yeah, and of it course makes there sense was for zombies to be slow because they're decomposing. You know, they're yeah. they're they're dead bodies that whose uh, ligaments and and nerves aren't all right, all there. <laughs> like you would think eventually the zombie problem might take care of itself because they would just sort of die out. I mean, if the humans could prevent themselves from getting killed, I guess. Well, yeah, you have to remember. I mean, that a zombie is just a human corpse. You know, and human corpses, what do they do? Decompose. They decompose. They degrade. They they even and, and they will do so differently depending on what region or climate that they're in. Like like for instance, I mean, one thing that dead bodies tend to have a propensity to do is build up gases and explode sometimes. <laughs> so in hotter weather, that's probably what you're going to have. You're going to have literal exploding zombies. You know, they kind of did that with The Last of Us Part Two. But yeah. The Last of Us Part Two, they're not actually proper zombies. They're uh, the cordyceps infection, which is a real life like fungus that. Like, yeah. That's a real over. thing. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So they actually d did incorporate that. And in part two, I believe, with the fourth stage of infection being different with there's bloaters in the original and then the other one has shamblers. And because yeah. they're in more humid climates, they actually explode. <laughs> yeah. And I think that in Left for Dead, they also had something similar to that as well. But I mean, also like up in like 
more Arctic regions, it's like you're going to have zombies succumbing to frostbite and the degradation that comes with that. I mean, honestly, a zombie outbreak could probably peter out pretty fucking quickly. It, it probably... COVID zombies? Oh, yeah. I mean, there is a COVID zombies movie, but that's a whole <laughs> so, nother... Can nice. I haven't seen it. Yeah. And of course, it's full moon, full moon features that did it. Yeah. Well, they, they sure capitalized on that pretty quick. <laughs> oh, they, they capitalized on Tiger King and the Murder Hornets as well. Oh, God. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> they capitalized on all of that. Fuck yeah. I want to watch that now. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. Cinema Snob has an episode on all of that. It's fucking intense. Y'all were watching the Nostalgia Critic review of this one, right? Yeah, it was hilarious. Dead. Yeah, he, he focused more on kind of ragging on it because he was like, yeah, this is an undisputed classic. This helped like change horror. It, it's a game changer, but there's some silly shit in here to make fun of, yeah. you know? And yeah, it has a lot of the horror conventions of its time, of the sci-fi conventions <laughs> of its time as well. I mean, it's know? not really scary when you watch it. Not by, you know, most standards of today, but I mean, there are some moments that are definitely, I think more so it, it's suspenseful and it's very tense. Yeah. See, um, if you were there's a kid, just sort of atmosphere. Go ahead. If you were a kid in the 1970s, it would scare the shit out of you, you know? Yeah. Oh, and by that, yeah. and by that point you would have already had Dawn of the Dead out, which was a yeah. way more graphic movie. I think we're just been desensitized to a lot of it, but yeah. even so, I mean, it, it, it is spooky in a sense whenever these, you know, you'll go through a portion of the movie with just normal proceedings, humans fighting each other. And then boom, all of a sudden, you know, something that's kind of a little freaky. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, well, nothing's more harrowing than seeing the little girl, the Cooper's daughter, you know, reanimated and, and feasting on her father. <laughs> yeah, that's that's <laughs> hardcore right there. Kills the man. mother with the was that shovel or a, a little uh, spade? That's what yeah. that is. Like cement it's a gardening, blocks. It's yeah. a gardening spade. Whoa, that's dude! What it is. Yeah, that that's interesting in its own right. Being murdered by a tool that is typically seen as a feminine pursuit, you know, gardening. I think it was sharp, dude. Oh, it was <laughs> very much so. Well, you used to really be scared here, Johnny. You're still afraid. Stop it now, I mean it. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Stop it. You're ignorant. They're coming for you, Barbara. Stop it. You're acting like a child. Look, they're coming for you. Look, there comes one of them now. He'll hear you. Here he comes now. I'm getting out of here. Johnny. I think it's about time that we go ahead and start wrapping things up. Robert, you're the one who chose this movie. I'm going to go ahead and ask you for your final thoughts first. So. The final thoughts. Oh, yeah. Also, get in the frame, Robert. Get in the frame, Skype Robert. Call. I can't. You can't? Yes, you can. There's no can't on this podcast. Both, Come on both, now. Pulls right there. Yeah. What do you think, Robert? What are your final thoughts? Final thoughts about this movie. I think, you know, every Halloween... It's plain. You should be watching it along with the Halloween marathons, right? Yeah. And, you know, just get ready to go trick-or-treating with your kids if you got kids, blah, blah, blah. For what this movie did, it did a lot for a lot of young independent filmmakers, you know, especially coming right out of 68. Yeah, this this was an independent movie for its time. Yeah, very independent yeah, it seems it seems like a lot of the best horror movies, you know, they start out that way. I mean, Halloween yeah. was an independent movie. Yeah, that was mostly Carpenter's first project at yeah. a, a film school. Oh, yeah. And, of course, Donald Pleasance was his main actor. He yeah. had starred with McQueen. He's been on Goldeneye, you know. Or what was that? Dr. No or something? Dr. No, yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. With Sean Connery. So still a major star. And that movie was made for Pleasance. God rest his soul. But what do you think of the legacy of this movie in regards to horror? God, this thing, it's still going to this day with the video games and what is that? The Walking Dead? We're going into like the 10th season or yeah, something? We're, we're, yeah, I think we're about to get into the final season of yeah, that dude, here pretty soon. Uh, dude, it did a lot for us. It did. Dude. Yeah, I mean, 
The right. idea, the idea of it in the, the whole apocalypse thing is just, you know, it's damn good. I don't know. Ash, what are your final thoughts? Oh, I mean, as you know, I'm glad that I got to see this for the first time, you know, as the progenitor of the zombie pop culture phenomenon, you know, and that extends beyond film. That extends beyond the world of cinema. I mean, now, like you guys said, we have video games, we have books and, and TV shows and comics and, mm -hmm. you know, stage plays and musicals. I mean, everything you can think of. Zombies are, you know, there's no other way to say it than other than a pop culture phenomenon. And that live. all owes. What's that? It's a way of life, like the Terminators. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, it yeah, all owes back to Romero's original work. And, you know, he was just kind of making a, you know, a cheesy B movie or so he says, you know, to see the amount. And I'm glad that he, you know, was around long enough to see what his work would become, because there's not a single American. There's not a single person in the, in the developed world that doesn't know what a zombie is. So I, I, I think that that's especially poignant. And, I, you know, another point I want to make is, you know, Folks, make sure that this Halloween, y'all are safe. You know, there's definitely, we've got a lot of shit going on right now. So whatever you're going to do, just make sure that you're safe about it and have a happy Halloween. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That, that, those are words of wisdom right there, I would say. And my final thoughts on this movie is the legacy of this movie is still being felt in, not just in pop culture, but in horror itself. Like, to this day. I mean, especially what it did for bringing really gory cinema to the forefront for the first time. I mean, this was not rated. This was an unrated movie. And it, it flew right in the face of the Hayes Code, which had been, you know, used in Hollywood for many, many years. It flew in the face of that. And, I mean, it pretty much change the way that we view what is actually scary and terrifying. And... I mean, this is a movie that's on the Criterion Collection, like it, it, and it's still a public domain movie. You know, and it's part of the. Uh, I was going to say that I forgot that it's a, a member of the National Film Registry, and he, yeah, uh, Robert wrote that on the itinerary. Yeah, it's also yeah, so. it's also in the Library of Congress as well. Yeah, yeah. right. I mean, th this is an important work that I mean. Anybody who is into horror in any way, they need to see this movie. It's pretty much essential. But, you know, I mean, the social commentary is palpable, even though uh, that wasn't Romero's actual intention. But just the fact that you can make so many different interpretations of this movie, it's just a testament to Romero's writing, to his directing and his directorial choices. I mean... He made one of the most impactful movies of the 20th century. So, I mean, what else is there to say? I mean, really. Hmm. Yeah. He's the man. He is the man. The man, bro. Yeah. But those are my final thoughts on Night of the Living Dead. And definitely, please be safe this Halloween. Have as much fun as you can. I mean, just dress up if you need to. I don't know if trick-or-treating is a good idea or not. No. Probably not. But, I mean, just have a happy, safe Halloween. And now we're going to go into our plugs. So this time we're going to start with Robert. You have a short film to plug, right? Yeah, it's Killing Night. And you can find that on YouTube. And maybe subscribe to my channel if you can. It's Robert yeah, Robert we'll, we'll include the link in the show notes to your channel. And I think we're going to also try to put it on the Collateral Cinema YouTube channel. Yeah, you can find it on uh, Facebook, Collateral Cinema Facebook page, my page, and check out the Instagram. Or on something. IGTV? Yeah. Right on. Well, all right, yeah. And, and and it stars yours truly. Yours truly. I mean, introducing Bo Maddox. And you, second lead. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, it's a good short film. It's a little rough around the edges, but check it out, folks. I mean, we put yeah. some work into it. it took so, a while. And it's horror. And it's horror, yeah. yeah. We, were, we were sitting on it for a while, so glad it's out now. Now, Ash, go ahead and make your plugs. All right. Well, if you love movies and you love video games as well, be sure to check out Collateral Gaming Video Game Podcast, the sister podcast of Collateral Cinema. We're going to have our Halloween special out on Until Dawn. Um, and we're also going to have a Halloween-themed bonus round episode as well, as I assume y'all are going to have more of like a Halloween-themed director's cut. Definitely, um, yeah. That, that's going to be forthcoming here very soon. 
Right, right. So, yeah, definitely check that out. Our season premiere on Majora's Mask will obviously have already been out. That'll have been our previous episode. And we'll speaking of zombies, I mean, we're going to be actually talking about The Last of Us Part 2 in November. That'll be our next episode after the Halloween. So stay tuned for all of that. And make sure to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, both Collateral Gaming and Collateral Cinema. Reach out to us on social media. You can definitely friend me or follow me. I pretty much accept all requests. Ashley Allen Chancellor. And definitely check out, you know, both the Collateral Cinema and Collateral Gaming pages. Subscribe to our Patreons. Yeah, definitely our, on our Patreons. We're going to have the Night of the Chicken Dead Poultry Geist commentary up there very soon. Best episode yet, so... Best commentary yet. Yeah, definitely. And, yeah, you can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Podbean, Chill Lover Radio, Instagram. You can find us, as we said, on Patreon. And also look for us on, what else? On Spotify as well. And Apple Podcast. Leave us a five-star there review go. there and leave us a five-star review on Podchaser as well. That will help us out tremendously. I see that we're kind of charting in other countries a little bit. So we appreciate all of the listeners uh, overseas and also become a follower on Twitter. We're trying to get up to at least 5,000 followers. That's kind of where Twitter starts taking some notice in the algorithms of your channel or whatever. So yeah, follow us there, become a patron on Patreon and yeah, check us out and wherever our, you get your podcasts. For our American listeners, hey, right around this time, voting's right around the corner, so go vote. Go guys. vote. Guys. Definitely. November Unless you're 3rd. voting for Donald Trump, don't go vote. Yeah, stay home. Vote. anyway let's go ahead and end this episode happy halloween everybody i'm bo maddox i'm robert ortegon and i'm ashley chancellor and this was collateral cinema check y'all later peace out bye Cinema is an L Company production. All music and movie clips are owned by the respective creators and are used for educational purposes only. Please don't sue us. We're poor.